welcome back to Controlling Ideas. Today we're joined by Alan Gannett, who is a serial entrepreneur. He has founded companies and he has also invested in companies. Most recently, he is also an author where he wrote the book, The Creative Curve, which is about finding the right ideas at the right time. I know he's gonna have a lot of great insights for us. So Alan, thank you so much for joining today. Thanks for having me. Um, also, I feel like we're, I needed to get the cool Zoom background memo. That I mean, that's like, you're the creative one. Look at that. Oh my God. In the this thought is, bubble. This is basically hiding the fact that my apartment looks like I'm losing a game of Jumanji right now. So <laughs> no one's judging. No one's judging. <laughs> Thanks for that. Uh, you know, just before we jumped on this recording, I was actually talking to you about how I believe that storytelling is something that can be taught. It's something that people can develop as a skill. And actually in your book, The Creative Game, uh, Creative Curve, you talk about how creativity itself can also be something that you can learn. W would you mind just going into a little bit of detail about that? Yeah, I mean, so the thing that's so interesting about creativity is it's one of the most discussed, talked about, hyped up sort of terms when it comes to innovation, when it comes to business, when it comes to art but we actually don't have a great understanding of what it really is, right? Like if you ask someone to define creativity, it's actually like kind of difficult because it's not just creating something, right? It's not like if I throw paint on a canvas, it's not worth anything. But when Jackson Pollock did it, it was worth millions and millions of dollars. So something like richer to creativity than just productivity. And as a result, when you want to look at creativity, it turns out you have to look at sociology, you have to look at psychology, you have to look at neuroscience, you look at this sort of wide class of the different social sciences because it turns out that creativity is this really fascinating mix of stuff that's going on in our brain, stuff that's going on in sort of the culture and society around us. It's one part social phenomenon, it's one part biological. And so it turns out that both of those things, the sort of biological underpinnings of creativity are really things you can get better at. Um, I talk about this in the book, but there's, there's practices you can do, there's things you can do to actually um, get yourself to be more creative, to have more aha moments, to have more inspiration. We can talk more about that. And then the other thing is that when you think of creativity as existing within a culture, existing within a society, existing within a set of social constructs, those are constructs that you can learn and actually think about in a constructive, thoughtful way and be strategic. And so that's a lot of what I talk about is this idea of that um, creativity is about creating the right idea at the right time. And the right time element, I think, is what trips up a lot of people, but is actually very, very learnable. That's fantastic. And, you know, when you're talking about the, the right time, uh, going back to the moment that you realize, I need to write this book, what was the right time for you? What was the right moment for you to say, this is the, the story that I need to tell? Yeah, so I'm um, originally from New Jersey. Um, so, you know, I don't have a cool accent like you do. Uh, I, I sort of barely escaped without a Jersey Shore accent. Do, do but, remember that to a lot of my audience, you probably do actually have a very Oh, good okay. Accent. Okay. This is great. This is great. <laughs> um, but um, in New Jersey, like, there's sort of like, we're kind of frustratable. Like, there's a lot of smog. We're on edge all the time. And so I'm just sort of like someone who gets a little, like, worked up at times. And I would just hear stories from people when I was running my company, which worked with marketers, like I would hear stories from people about how, um, you know, I'm not that creative or like, that's not me or I don't have those skills. And it's very like defeatist attitude. And this can be kind of frustrating because when I had creativity, my takeaway was that it is something you can get better at. It is something you can get learnable. And I realized over time that my perspective on creativity is not widely held. The 95% of people believe that creativity is this sort of magical thing that some people have and most people don't. If you don't have it, well, you're screwed. And like, that's just not true. Like, and we can go into like the details of why it's not true, but like, that's not how it really works. And so I just got kind of fed up and uh, I started by writing a speech that sort of tackled some of these questions and I started giving that speech. And I found that people really responded really well to it. And it just got me motivated being like, okay, this is a message that's important. That's something I care about. Um, and then I think there's an opportunity here to write a book that's a little bit different. And so what's different about this book than a lot of books on creativity is um, it's very, 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 very deep in the research. So there's a lot in there, but I still try and tell it in a way that's easy, fun to read. Um, and so it's not, you know, it's not 
I feel like some books in the genre is sort of like, here's one thesis, and then here's 300 pages of examples of the thesis. This book, the goal is every chapter you're learning something new about creativity that's actionable and that's interesting. It's funny that you say that. There's a YouTube channel that I absolutely love called The Productivity Game, which does mm. like six to eight minute recaps of a lot of these books. And it does exactly that. It literally takes like the one page of like, here's what they say. And then they use like a hundred different yeah. examples to prove this. Yeah, uh, it's, it, uh, my, it's a flaw of my genre. <laughs> amazing and like for you then like you've obviously done a huge amount of research here and it sounds like that there's that misconception that 95 percent of people think like oh this isn't something like what other kind of misconceptions have you seen other than like i can't learn this or i can't I mean, do this myself one of the most common ones i think is sort of is, is fascinating because it's so wrong is the idea of the sort of solo genius or the solo creator and a lot of people will point out people like Steve Jobs or J.K. Rowling or these people who are very famous and have these stories, but like what they're missing is that any successful creative has what I call a creative community. And that means different things for different people. But if you look at Steve Jobs, for example, like on day one, he had Steve Wozniak. He knew he wasn't technical enough. So he literally had a technical co-founder. He actually raised venture capital very early on and had multiple employees in the first year. So this idea that he was like single-handedly like building this company by himself is like, once you sort of think about it, it's like obviously comical, it's obviously sort of fanciful, but like these are how we're told the sort of marketing, PR, Hollywood, cover fast company versions of creativity, we internalize those as the truth. Elon Musk in there, a great example. I mean, one of the things people forget about Elon Musk is that he didn't actually found Tesla. It was actually something that was already existing. He came in and invested, then invested more, then eventually became CEO. They have been working on this. You know, the reason why he can run, you know, two, sometimes three companies, is he has a lot of really, really smart people working for him. And of course, when we build people up and we talk about the sort of mythology and these people, we, we give them a lot of credit because that's a great story. But the reality is that when you look at it, that's just not true. I mean, even authors, right? We have editors, copy editors, marketing teams, cover designers, fact checkers, researchers. Like there are a lot of people that are involved in creating a book, but ultimately who gets credit is a social phenomenon. And it's changed over time. Like in music, for example, in the 90s, the idea of pop stars was there's sort of, we tried to create this myth that like they wrote the songs by themselves. So if you look at the songwriting credits for like a Britney Spears album, it was like Britney wrote, wrote them by herself. And like, that's not true, right? <laughs> now there's the idea of a celebrity producer. And so now you actually see them more and more um, singers are bragging about who's co-writing their songs with them, which is really who's writing their songs. In fact, now some of those producers have actually moved and are starting to become, you know, famous in their own right for their own music and because, you know, they're sort of rising and sort of stock within the sort of cultural capital. And so you have this fascinating myth, right? This idea of the solo genius, uh, which I think has been perpetuated and I think is unfortunately really detrimental because it makes us think, if I can't do all these things myself, then I'm not going to be successful creatively. In reality, what those creatives all have in common is they're very self-aware. They're very good at realizing, here's what I'm good at, here's what I'm bad at, and finding other people to help them with the things they're bad at. If I had to say there's one magic thing to creativity, that would be self-awareness. Like that is the most essential skill because so many of the things you can do to become better at your craft derived from self-awareness that is really fascinating and i think that's really apt for a lot of the people that i i talk to because i'm talking to a lot of founders and startups and i think you know while you all need to be self-aware there's like that duality of being self-aware while at the same time being confident enough to be able to tell your story but know where your faults are to kind mm -hmm. of uh especially when you're going to investment ironic, ironically like the more aware you are of your faults often the more confident you become because they're not these sort of scary monsters right but they're these things you're aware of you learn how to live with them um and you learn how to you know, bring other people in to support you on those which sort of ironically makes you more confident that is fantastic and for you then you know you're an investor yourself like what are the kind of things that you look for within businesses that you partner with or you invest with? So uh, I do all pre-seed and seed. So it's all sort of like, 
you know, everything from PowerPoint stage to sort of like early traction, not too much later than that. And so for me, it's basically like founder and market, founder being number one. And so like, do I think the founder is compelling? Most of the people I invested in have known for a long time, but like not all of them. Um, in fact, some of them I'll meet and then, you know, just sort of fall in love with them from a sort of work perspective, right? And be like, okay, like I need to invest in that person. And then is the market uh, sort of big? Is it ripe for opportunity for change? Um, is there a real problem here? And sort of when those two things are both sort of like screaming yeses, right? Like the founder is really compelling. And we can talk more about what compelling means. And the market's really compelling. That's when it's an easy yes. When the founder's really compelling with the market not so sure, usually it's still a yes. And when the market's really compelling, the founder's not, that's usually no. Um, and that's sort of a good way to sort of get foiled because at the stage I'm investing in, which is super, super, super early, like so much of like what's gonna happen is like gonna be way different than the reality of where they're starting. Very, very few companies at the pre-seed stage by the time they get Series A look anything alike. Um, and in terms of what makes a founder compelling, I think the key thing is self-awareness, right? It's like self-awareness because if you think about what it takes to build a startup, you have to know where in your market there's opportunities, where your product or offering needs improvement. You need to know what type of roles to hire for. You need to know um, what other people are motivated by. And often people who are self-aware are also very emotionally aware of other people. And so I have to say like self-awareness in addition to sort of all the checkbox things, you know, like honesty, integrity, dedication, intelligence, like those I think are sort of obvious. But I think the one that to me is always the most compelling is self-awareness. When someone is deeply self-aware, that's something I definitely want to invest in. I really like that. And that ties so well to what you were saying, where it's like, you know, if you, if you try, if I was a startup founder and I tried to go in as if I was like this one man genius trying to do everything. Right. Myself, yeah, exactly. You wouldn't be interested then. And you'd almost be like, this guy, this guy's going to be hit hard and he's yeah. going to crash and burn. Yeah. Um, so it sounds like then uh, really it's a mixture of the, the right idea at the right time and the uh, compelling personality, but who is very self-aware. Sounds like it would be a good idea for anybody watching this video to check out the book, uh, The Creati uh, Creative Curve. Um, for you, <laughs> I will make sure to link to it in the bottom of this video. Always a marketer, right? We're always marketing. <laughs> Alan, uh, thank you so much for your time today. One last question. What is next for you and your career? I am working on a new book. And so I am uh, typing away on a new book. Um, topic is TBA, but um, it is going well. I'm just in the sort of like, if you ever seen those charts of like, sort of like the creative journey, or it's like, oh, this is really exciting and fun. And like, oh, I'm like, sort of like, I just sort of got through the valley of despair again. And I'm like, okay, like, <laughs> got my momentum. But, uh, you know, spend a few weeks sort of like being like, this is never going to write itself. So. That's fantastic. Well, we're definitely looking forward to that. Alan, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks, bud. Bye.